Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today uh, we start uh, actually start our course. As you know, I already posted assignment three. So in assignment three, uh, you basically install some tools that let you to simulate a Hadoop environment on your system. Uh, later on, we actually install the actual Hadoop environment, and we have other experiments, but. Uh, this is your assignment, which I already give you the solution. So first part, we need to have a tool that uh, lets you to be let you to able to simulate. So for this one, uh, I put the link for VirtualBox. Just click on it, and if uh, just pick the uh, based on your own system, if it's Windows OS or Linux or Mac. So I go to Windows, just download and install. I think it's pretty straightforward. Second one is a pre-installed Hadoop ecosystem. Just click on it. So you, you are, uh, if you click on it, you direct to the Cloudera website. Uh, Cladero purchased Horton Sandbox. This is another company who provides that simulated environment. So having said that for installation type, you can either uh, say VirtualBox, VMware, or Docker. I already downloaded for VirtualBox. So I click on VirtualBox. Let's go. Here, just provide your information. This is my email. So. And uh, so what else? Okay, what do you want college and university? So you provide your information here. Uh, and also just keep in mind, you should say what is your, your purpose or what is the usage? Then you press continue, accept, submit. So since uh, this is a pre-installed Hadoop ecosystem, it needs a lot of hardware from your side. So I'm going to uh, download 2.6.5, but if you want uh, 3.0 is also fine too. So this is for having some flavor of Hadoop and just touch it. So we don't go that much in depth, even uh, HTTP Sandbox 3.01 is not that much new. Uh, so this is since it needs a lot of hardware from your side. I'm going to pick the middle one, 2.6.5. But if you want to download 3.0.1, that's fine too. So pick the middle one. So it needs 15 gigabytes of hard drive. So I stop the download. Um, so for the next class, uh, at least download the HTTP have um, virtual box and also there's another one which is putty if you're a mac user you don't have to so for your assignment if you're using mac just put a snapshot from your computer that shows you have mac os otherwise same as the this one just click and download putty so putty is basically for making a connection from 
your own PC to that simulated environment. Also, later on, we use Putty. Like, let's say we want to connect to AWS server. Putty helps you to connect your own PC to the AWS or any other basically cloud-based systems. Putty helps you to just make a connection. If you are using Linux or Mac, you can directly connect to those servers. You don't have to have Putty. This is your assi next assignment. So, at least if you want, I think you can Google how to install Hadoop over VirtualBox or VMware. It's, it's not difficult, but also show you how to do that. So, for the next session, I'll have it ready. Bring your own laptop so we can, if you have some issues, I can fix it for you. Um, but it's not difficult. Basically, after you download, you just need to browse into the virtual box and dedicate some RAM, hard drive, those kind of things. So be very generous for the amount of RAM that you want to dedicate. Hello, Professor. So let's see. Even my, I think I, okay, so my. Basically, you just make a new one. You need to dedicate uh, memory. So my RAM is very hard. As you see, I have 32 gigabytes of RAM. So I can be very generous, but for you, don't dedicate less than 16. So the amount of uh, RAM that you want to dedicate should be at 16 gigabytes. If you don't have that much of RAM, that's okay, but your system would be very slow. So maybe I name it class HTTP. Use an existing virtual hard drive. It's ready, so we can do it together and you learn how to do it. So let me delete for now. But basically, uh, this is a Linux operating system that has Hadoop ecosystem on top of it. So you don't have to install Linux and you don't have to install Hadoop. You just upload to this virtual mix. But again, no worries. Next session is we have a lab, building your own laptop, and we just do the steps together. Hello, Professor. Uh, excuse me, Professor. So basically, your third assignment is nothing just downloading Putty, Virtual Drive, HTTP, and have it ready for the next lab. I think Muchan Shunk has a question. What's your yeah. question? Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Unfortunately, I cannot hear you. Let's see if it's my system problem. One, two. Which I think is not my my problem. Let oh, me professor. change the speaker. So, can you say again? Hello, professor. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, I cannot hear you. Okay, just type your question. So let me see what's wrong. Right. 
Okay, I, I showed in the beginning of class. So let me upload the video later, but uh, you can just go to your assignment tree, click on Horta installation, and just pick uh, virtual box and Horton or HTTP 2.6.5. You can do it too, but for your class, I too I would do 2.6.5 because it needs a lot of hardware. So I don't want you guys to stuck on three if it needs more uh, system requirements. But we don't spend too much of time on, on uh, Horton Sandbox. We just have some exper small ex ex experiments. Huh? The features that we use now, they're the same. Yeah, for your summary uh, tree, you just uh, upload, make it like Word document, upload screenshots, and that's. So people in the class, do you guys have questions? Basically, assignment tree, it just means you should have those files ready for the next lab. Okay, let's have some uh, some concepts concepts to review. You if before running experience, at least you need to have, know some idea about what you are doing and what is the concept or background uh, behind of those experiments. Anyway. We are in the big data era, but what does big data mean? So if you look at it literally, it just means a big amount of data, but it's not just that. It, maybe it used to be like 20 years ago, but right now one factor, there's four Vs. The first one is velocity. So, so there's a high speed of data production. So it could be some sensor data, some social media data, uh, you name it. So there is a high amount of data which is produced almost every second. So every second, you have a huge amount of data. You need to, for making it informative decisions and helping your managers to make, to make, uh, to have a more informative decisions, you need, to, you need to know how to handle that high velocity. So later on, you have some Python experiment. You would see handling such a data with Python is it, almost impossible. It's very hard. But you you have basically you you will feel that why uh, for such a high velocity, maybe some simple codes like Python doesn't help. Variety. So there's so many different types of data. You might have a lot of experience with structured data. You might remember in your uh, business intelligence, we had we worked with some unstructured data like text, which your data is done in rows and columns. On, on top of that, image, audio, social media, there's so much different types of data. So handling them with uh, structured databases or relational database management systems like SQL is very hard. I don't say it's impossible, it was still almost impossible. Okay, the, the most intuitive one is volume. So just look at the amount of uh, 2.7 billion comments and likes creates every second. So every day for Facebook, but this is, is this data is not new. I, I'm pretty sure right now it should be much more. More specifically, Facebook uh, uh, has a has re, uh, acquired net Instagram. That is actually that one has more comments and likes right now. Maybe your dads and moms using Facebook, but our generation maybe TikTok, Instagram, or uh, what it is a Chinese one. I forgot. Do you guys have? Is uh, social media in China? Which is, is it WeChat? 
Okay, yeah. So all of them create so much of information. This the volume of that is very high. The last one is veracity. This is actually a challenge. So basically, reliability of data. Some data may not be relevant, also, and may not be that much reliable. On top of that, maybe it's not uh, very correlated. So do you guys remember we had issue of fake data or fake news? So in the last US presidency, so it was a lot of talks about the fake news. So if you do your analysis on, top, uh, on that, some data is that, which is not reliable or fake, probably your results are not uh, reliable too. So is there anyone here from different, with a major different from business analytics? I think all of you should be in business analytics. So why there is such a major? Why you are studying or why people hire you for that? Yeah, you gave me a very specific answer, which is correct. So because we are in the data era, so or big data era, so and that has value. So people who can process data and make some informative decision or informative suggestions are valuable too. Since you are valuable, people hire you. So one part of uh, business analytics is how to able to handle large amount of data or big data and being able to run analytics. So first part of this course, you learn why should you, you handle big amount of data or big data different from ordinary data. Then you have some experiment on or some experience on data management. If I oversimplify it, it's like SQL in the big data environment. And the last part of this course, which just gets easier and easier, you run some predictive analytics over big data. By the way, this course could be uh, like two or three courses, but we just mash them into one course. And uh, it depends on your destination. So, and I believe most of you would do, would run predictive analytics or some kind of analytics over data. Maybe you won't focus that much on data management for that purpose. So, our so the content that we cover over data management is much less than uh, predictive analytics or big data. But we have some, uh, basically some sessions that you do some data management in the big data environment, or which later you, are, you would see what I mean environment, I mean Hadoop ecosystem, but uh, we talk about it later on. Okay, any questions so far? Unfortunately, over Zoom, yeah, here, there is no question. Okay, so what is your first idea or first suggestions for processing a very large amount of data that has high volume, high volume and uh, high uh, veracity? Pardon me? Yeah, but let's let's say even cleaning your data is difficult. What should you, what would you do? Maybe it's so large you cannot even clean it. So with your PC, maybe you try think of buying a better PC, right? A more a PC with a high a computing capacity. Maybe uh, yeah, cloud platform. Pardon me? Yeah, these are very creative ways. Uh, but I'm actually, uh, what I'm going to talk right now about that is uh, your hardware capacity. So you have two options. It, I mean, I know you can do it to, to over cloud or you have your purchase by yourself. But the, at the end, uh, you either need to have a very large computer or a supercomputer 
So let's say in Clark, we want to make our own Bitcoin. So it needs a lot of computing power. So you either need to buy a supercomputer to run that blockchain, or maybe you need to have some parallel systems that work together and handle a large amount of that. So you either have a very high computing center or you have small computing centers that work together. So maybe you have, instead of one, you might have 10 computing center on nodes. Let's, let's talk them, be more technical and call them nodes. So let's say you have, you might have uh, 10 computing nodes that each of them uh, process a part of your data and work in parallel. So these are two options. So before looking at these two options, so let's look at the hard, hard drive price. So this is a Pan American that is uh, transporting. I mean, Pan American is actually is, uh, bankrupt. So there's no, this is a, like uh, A-line, which used to be the most famous one. So five megabytes of hard disk cost $35,000 in 1956, which if you include inflation is much more than that. But so even $35,000 for five megabytes of hard drive is unbelievable, right? So I think your cell phones have, um, for mine, I, I think it has 120,000 megabytes, but I bought it almost $1,000. This is just five megabytes. Now look at the pr price change. So in 1997, two gigabytes cost 157 per gigabyte. 2004, $1 per gigabyte. 2015, 29, sorry, two cents, almost three cents per gigabyte. And this is a quote that I just got it from Amazon. I know that you might find, I put the eight gigabytes, sorry, eight terabytes or 8,000 gigabytes of hard drive, but I'm pretty sure you might find different prices, but this is what I got it today. So just two cents per gigabytes. So as you see, the price of hard drive is just going down. Maybe it's now almost a plateau. Is that there's not too much of changes right now? Uh, because maybe the technology technology of hard drive is kind of mature, but it's going. It went down significantly. So going back, that two options: either a, a supercomputer or some parallel computing nodes. The cost. I mean, the hard drive cost is very minuscule in comparison to whole system. So means maybe if you have too many hard drives, it's, it's, a, it's a still it's not cheap, but much cheaper than CPU or comp, uh, basically, uh, I, I, do you guys know what the CPU means? Okay, <laughs> okay, so I don't need to. So you don't, spend too much on the storage price, but probably you spend much more on the computing parts. Also look at uh, read time. So when it's about just two gigabytes, it takes almost two minutes. Then 200 gigabytes, one minute. But 3,000 gigabytes and 8,000 gigabytes almost takes four hours in the most efficient and ideal uh, time. It could be even much more than that. So as you see, the price of hard drive is getting so much cheap, but still it needs a lot of time to read those data. Even your processors or CPUs are very fast, but you cannot fit too much of data on them, it was very slow. Okay, so what does it mean if even instead of eight, eight terabytes or 8,000 gigabytes, 
if I have a very large computer with like, let's say, one million gigabytes or like maybe one hundred terabytes, still, if if still, even if I have very good PC, still I have a bottleneck on the how much I can read per second. But it's pretty cheap. So each hard drive is cheap, but it takes a lot of time to be to be able to read them. So, do you think if you have uh, several parent nodes, look at the situation, I can expedite the reading time because in each node, I just read a part of the data. So if I have 10 nodes, um, each, each of them read 10% uh, of the data, what would be my uh, read time? Instead of four hours, four hours divided by four. So it's 10, because I have 10 nodes. So having said that, if you have prior nodes, you can read your data much faster. Because you divide, you divide your data in 10 sections, and each node just read a part of that. So let's say you're Amazon, and uh, you have millions of customers. For Amazon, it doesn't make sense to have a, uh, a one super computer center. They have unlimited cash, but maybe it's better to have so many parent nodes. So maybe some nodes take care of customers in the East United States, some maybe in Texas, some in California, maybe one uh, node for Southern India, one node for maybe North of India, one node for East of China. So maybe it's better. To, is Amazon in China too? No? So let's talk about Alibaba. Maybe Alibaba has a different nodes in different parts of China. It doesn't make sense for them to have a very, a very strong supercomputer center. Yeah, Okay. So one benefit of having parent nodes is you expedite your read time much. You make your reading uh, speed much faster. Let's uh, go over other issues. So, so what if let's say. Um, uh, your Amazon, even you do something very smart that with the one supercomputer, you expect that you read time. You can read all of the customers so fast. Um, but let's say you have a competitor that they hire a hacker and they hack your supercomputer center. Your business would be gone. But if you have several nodes that works in parallel, you don't care. Let's say if you have 100 nodes in the United States for Amazon, if somebody had 20 of them, they still can run their business, but maybe slower. Yeah, somebody hacks, or maybe you have poverty issues, or like maybe you have some hardware problem. So still you have several other nodes that, that can handle your, your business. Maybe it's slower, but still you run your business. So maybe instead uh, on, uh, on top of throughput speed, maybe it's much safer if you have several pair of nodes that are weaker than a supercomputer, but still uh, you, you, can, you are more reliable on, in terms of providing your service. I think Facebook had an issue, I think a few months ago. So one of uh, their major centers had a problem. So uh, they lost their service. So somebody had to come back to that center, open up the keys and they just try to find what is the problem. But if they, had, if they could replicate that process in several nodes, maybe they, they, you have 
Facebook and Instagram on that day. Do you guys remember what I'm talking about? It was one day that Facebook just stopped. Uh -huh. Yeah, so sometimes we cannot do pair processing for some tasks, but for many of them, you can. So if you can do parallel processing, you have several centers. And uh, as you see, the hard, hard drive cost is not that much expensive. So you might have several nodes, and in each node, you copy a version of your that whole of your data. Maybe Amazon copy all of the customer's information to 100 nodes. Because the, for them, hard drive is not too much expensive. It's a faded chip. Sure. So, the yeah. yeah, one of your assignments that we can talk. Yeah, sometimes you cannot do prior processing, or maybe you can, but your result is not that much accurate. So, okay, I have, I have to talk about the assignment sooner. So let's say you have, just make an example. Uh, let's say you pick, you make five random notes on a piece of paper. So, and in each of them, to just put some random numbers. So, if I have a marker, maybe, Unfortunately, there's no markers here. Okay, so you, let's say you have a, a data set. It maybe have some numbers, random numbers. So you divide your data in 10 sections, and in each node, or five sections, let's make it easy. So divide your data in five parts, and in each node, compute the, its mean and median. So you have five nodes, each node calculate 20% of, uh, I mean, take care of 20% of your data and calculate mean and median. Okay. So then combine all the results together and see uh, which one is accurate. So is it for, can you do pair processing to calculate the median? Or can, uh, can you do pair processing to calculate the mean? Yeah, just do experiment. We talked about it later. So, so, and you can see sometimes you cannot do pair processing. Okay, so we talked about, uh, we actually we had the comparison between of one supercomputer versus several prior processing nodes. We talk about the cost, the scalability, reliability. What about security? What happens if you have uh, if you do prior processing? So let's say you have one hundred nodes. Each node has all the all of your information. Yeah, I mean, taking care of the security over so many nodes is much harder than just one or two nodes. So yeah, might be, and uh, some of the data is so, uh, maybe, I mean, there is a privacy attached to them. So like healthcare data or like maybe some financial data, maybe if you copy your data 100 lo different locations, it may prone to more security problems. Yeah, this is the same I was talking about. So you don't have to make five notes, just make some random notes. And I don't care if you give me right, correct answer or wrong answer, but I, I give you the answer later. So 
But what about cloud computing? You heard of uh, cloud computing a lot. So is actually, if it's not, uh, it's not a big issue. So over in cloud computing, basically you reach to a, a company and you, you take their hardware. So it could be just one very high capable computing node or even over Amazon, maybe you can uh, get several nodes in parallel and they work in parallel too. So at the end, cloud just means you don't pay for hardware. Many times is um, uh, much more economical to use cloud computing. So let's say if I want to power processing over Clark, maybe you need to have a co computer engineer, maybe you need to have a couple of TAs, you should pay for them, you should pay for rent, hardware, so on and so forth. So cloud is not cheap, but maybe for short-term businesses is cheaper. Or sometimes you have a startup and you are not sure how would be your business. How, how could you survive your first year? Or maybe your business would grow so fast that you cannot anticipate at this time. So early on for your startup, maybe even for Google, I think, do you guys know Shashan Gupta? He, he's one of your alumni. I think he's in, right now in, uh, there's a big marketing firm in Boston. He used to be Antics a student. BCG. Huh? BCG. BCG, yeah, he's in BCG. So he used to be in a startup. They applied for one, I think 120K grant from Google. So they got a cloud, grant from Google to do uh, their, I mean, their computation over their server. So when you have cloud, so you start using the cl uh, maybe cloud and just step by step, maybe after one year, you think your startup is working. So maybe you can uh, uh, invest more or ask investor to invest in your company. On top of that, you can imagine, uh, you can have a better idea. Is it worth of is better to buy those equipments or still using uh, Amazon or Google Cloud. So that time you have a better idea of how much harder and software you need. If you, your business is kind of stable, it's much, much better to have your own system. In my point of view, maybe I'm wrong. This is just a subjective idea because Amazon and AWS, they pay for rent, power, and maybe computer engineers, so many staff, and they need to charge surplus on top of that to be beneficial for them. AWS is one of the most profitable part of Amazon. So if you are sure about your business, scale of your business, and you know what you are doing, maybe it's better to purchase, but whenever you're not sure if whether if you can survive or not, and also, how much hardware you need, maybe it's better to use a cloud. I could be wrong, this is very subjective. But cloud computing is a, a very profitable business for Walmart, Amazon, Alibaba, they make a lot of money. Okay, so... So when you do power processing, or let's talk about, let's just change it, the term to distributed computing. So these are the challenge that you might have availability. So let's say you have 10 nodes, suddenly two of them are out of service. How do you manage it? So now you should distribute your work on eight nodes instead of 10 nodes. Data consistency, you copied your data 10 times, so if they are exactly the same, is that consistent? Sometimes you want to add a new record, you should copy 10 times over your system. Synchronization, you, you, you want to do power processing, they should be synchronized. You might face some failures or cascading failures, it means just almost the system getting ruined, so in the cascade mode. So you need an ecosystem that handle all of these challenges. 
So it's the reason for made Hadoop. So basically, if I oversimplify, Hadoop is like an operating system, but, uh, but it handles several nodes that you do this, uh, distributed computing. So Hadoop manage all the copy of the data, do synchronization and take care of failures and data availability. So it has two major parts. One is HDFS, which is distributed file system and map reduce or map shuffle reduce. So map shuffle reduce just means map your process in several nodes. Shuffle means just sort your data and reduce means just do calculation and reduce to one report. This is the, uh, the uh, general methodology behind the Hadoop, but this is much more complex than that. And so uh, we have one experiment later on, which is your most difficult assignment. So you do a prior process. Uh, we had we got disconnected from the Zoom, so let me just go back. Okay, yeah. Can you see? Okay, so yeah, I, as I said, uh, one of the advantage of Hadoop is the scalability. So when your business is uh, uh, just grow more and more, you can just add several nodes. So it makes your life much easier. It works over Linux. So if you are a Mac user, it actually is a better fit for your system, but uh, in Clark, our default system is Windows. So we do some experiment over Windows, but if you are a Mac user, you also can do it because Mac is also has a lot of similarity with Linux. Fault tolerance. So I talk, uh, as I said, some of your notes might be, uh, get out of, uh, they get out of service, but still Hadoop can easily manage Hadoop. There is some technologies within Hadoop ecosystem that can take care of them.
Okay, this is like a Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS. So this is the uh, basically a general uh, node or cluster. So it has two sections, name node or master node, slave node or data node. So later we do installation over a Windows system. So you see that two part. So you have you will have a folder for your data node and another folder for name node on your system. And when we run plus uh, had to cluster on your system, you see such a thing. Even sometimes you get errors like that data node there or name node there. Or... So basically, name node is a brain. So it just uh, manage uh, space metadata and also take care of the slave nodes. A slave or data nodes, they, they do the calculation. For example, if you want to calculate the mean or median, it just, uh, it, they, uh, the, your data would be processed through your data node. I put some sample codes. I mean, no worries, I'm later to take care of them. Okay, so I made a video one time. So let me just run it. But I also need to see if your friend over Zoom can see that. Uh, so, share sound. Is a question? Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about MapReduce, which is Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about MapReduce, which is a programming model for parallel processing. Hadoop and Spark are two well-known platforms that adopt this model. But let's explore it through an example. In this example, we are going to sum up numbers of the cards through MapReduce. In the first step, we sort or shuffle the cars based on their type and map to the different computing nodes. So we just want to count num uh, the numbers on different types of the cars. So the first step uh, is uh, take care of a portion of your data on each node. So here we have four nodes. And so first we map them, then sort based on their type. So as you see, based on their kind. So as you see, for example, spades, heart, they are sorted. So this is a shuffle part. In each node, we do image processing and count the numbers. However, these computations are done in parallel. So we save time in compared with sequential processing. In the last step, we reduce or summarize the nodes calculations in a report. You can perform this experiment with your colleagues and increase quantity of the cards to understand how map reduce. So let me just go back. So we have a deck of cards. So I want to just randomly pick some cards. So I have a data set, which is my, my card sample. And I will count uh, number, total numbers on each kind. For example, uh, what is the summation of the numbers on my hard cards or spade cards? So I want to do it over Hadoop ecosystem methodology, which is map, shuffle, and reduce. First, I copy my data in four nodes. In each node, I do sorting. So I sort based on the card kinds. And at the end, I just reduce, or reduce just means may summarize your calculation into one report. So for example, if you sum up the parts, three plus two plus seven plus one, is uh, where is my 
I did a wrong calculation maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, but I think you got the point. So, it's paid. Let's see if I did right. I think I had some miscalculations, but, but you got the point. So, uh, in the mapping part, you just randomly divide your data to, for each node. So in the mapping part, for, you just uh, divide, if, since I have two, uh, four nodes, I divide my 25% uh, of data on each node and tell them, okay, you take care of this 25, you take care of this 25, you take care of this 25. But all the nodes have all the data. But for processing, they just take care of 25%. Then I do sort or shuffling. So sort based on the cards kind. And at the end, it just reduced to one report, which I need calculating and making more reports. Does, does MapReduce make sense for you guys? What it generally is doing? Yeah, club I think is right. Yeah, it should be nineteen. Nine plus ten, king, and soldier. I just disregard that because there is no number on. It. I know you can you can consider number to it, but uh, I just disregard soldier, king, and uh, ace. Okay, this is another one. So we have a uh, job input, Alice, Bob, Carlos, Diana. They are different outputs. We just want to sum up the total outputs per each person. So the output, we want to be like that. So we just sum up all of the outputs for Alice, for Bob, Carlos, and Diana. But let's do it through MapReduce uh, methodology. So first, uh, you map your data in, uh, here we have five nodes. So you randomly divide your data in five sections. Although we know each section has the, all of the data, but we just uh, assign here 20 almost 20% of data to each node for processing. Then. We sort based on their name. Shuffle or sort means same thing. We just uh, based on their name, just sort them. And finally, we just reduce to, to one report that has all information. So, yeah. Something like this, wouldn't uh, using sequence where Yes, you can do the school through school as long as your data is not big data. If your data is like Amazon data, you cannot do that. Yeah, you can do it over SQL, but when you have Amazon scale data, your SQL would crash. So actually later on I teach you pig. The name is uh, funny, but pig is actually equivalent of a SQL in Hadoop ecosystem. Even we do something similar with Python, but you see that that's really difficult. So there is basically two structure or architecture for, uh, I mean, master slave nodes. One is just you have a master node and you have some slave nodes and you do one job per node. When you have several jobs or when your node is, uh, have more computing power, so you, each job gets an application name and you submit your job to the node. 
So this is a, for more advanced nodes. Later on, you see something similar. So we work with the cloud and you just assign the application number to your job and assign to the data node. Uh, or basically you assign to the master, a master assigned to the slave node. So having said that, just keep in mind when we talk about application number and when you have application master, it just means that node can handle several jobs. This, I mean, uh, I mean, this data or this is what could be a little fuzzy, but later when you do hands-on experiences, you see that they make more sense. So most likely when you use cloud, use this configuration. So you have a master node. Your slave node has two sections. One is application master and the one node manager. Each job has an application manager assigned to it. The application name. Okay, because um, there's only one application manager per node. Yeah, there is a, one application for the node, but that application gets several applications. I mean, later on, actually, this part, you don't need to take care of hardware that much. But when we uh, assign a job to a cloud, you see that uh, we create an application name, it's just for that. So just later when you see application name, it just means you're submitting your job to a node that can handle several jobs. So, and it's actually, it's funny. So that cloud is free. So your data is very small. So when you submit your data, you get the results so quickly. But in the industry scale, when you submit a job, maybe it takes like sometime one hour. So uh, what, what you want to uh, just basically check the status of your job or application. So you have an application name, you go to the node and check what percentage of your data is processed. So application name is just the ID number for your job basically. And you can check its status. And, but no worries, later on, actually we do some Python in Hadoop ecosystem and that Python, we assign application name for your codes. I think it's enough for today. Let's don't just uh, load too much information. So, okay, we have our next lab. I just show you how to uh, install Hadoop or HTTP 2.6.5 over virtual work. I think if you Google it, you can easily find it, but Next class, I'll show you. I think, yeah, let's just have a little more time. Just let me finish it. So uh, within Hadoop ecosystem, you learn some technologies like peak. So if you look at peak, peak codes, does it look familiar to you? Like group by, join? Yeah, it seems like a skill. So, you will learn later on, but uh, if you want to do all the map reduce for data management, it's really hard. So for data management, you can easily use peak. So you basically type uh, something like a SQL, but at, in under the hood, had to run several map reduce, which you 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 don't need to uh, take care of. So Hadoop is for, it's not just for big data handling is also for ease of use. So the ease of use part is you don't need to learn new language. So for P, some of them could be new, but it almost looks like a zero. Even later on, you learn PySpark, which is very similar to Python, but for a big data environment. If you have time, you look over high, but it's also similar to SQL. HBase is also for data management, Scoop, it's just for loading your data in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, we, we also have experience with Flume. So for data gathering, Uzi, yes. Cloud, the remaining is just an advertisement for cloud company. You can read them, but yeah. So 
I also put the instruction for doing that, but so if you look at the your last slide, I show you how to basically install Hadoop over your virtual box. You can even follow these slides and just do it by yourself. But again, no worries. Next class, I'll show you how to do it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I know I just loaded too many information. So again, please skim through the slides and maybe you can just check what peak means, what edge base means, what hype means. But at least I covered peak because I think it's a very good tool for data management and we might look at scoop and other technologies too. Let's see if there's some questions over Zoom. I don't question. So again, for your attendance, okay. So for your attendance, people who are using Zoom, uh, you should submit a class summary. For people in the class, you don't have to. So for you, it's optional for them. They, they should submit as their attendance. Okay, I need to stop sharing because I'm, I want to take care of attendance of your friends in the class. So let me stop sharing. So either over your uh, phone or your computer, please go to this link and put your uh, information. This is for your attendance. And don't do it later because this one records the time that you respond. So, oh my God, what happened? You can go after, if you submit your attendance, you don't, you can. Tell us it's over. I'm just waiting for your friends to enter the information. Yeah, email is enough. Yeah, people who are over Zoom, you can leave the class. Actually, I'm taking care of your friend's attendance. So class is over, actually. So let me stop recording.